Hello and welcome to the Night Crew Duty Log. I'm Peter C. Haywood, the creator of Night Crew, and this is our behind the scenes series of interviews with the cast. Today we have Sung Won Cho, the voice of Captain Mansfield and Aston Calamiris. He goes into how his YouTube career got started, how he got into voice acting, and some of the interesting differences between voice acting for video games versus animation. It's some really good stuff in there. Just a reminder, our Kickstarter campaign is still running. If you head to nightcrewpodcast.com and click on the big Kickstarter link, then you can support the show. If we can reach our funding goal, we're going to make a whole series of Night Crew episodes. And as you can tell from these interviews, the cast and I are very excited about that. So please please check it out. You can pledge as little as $5 and it'll really help us get the show made. If you haven't done so yet, please tell your friends either about the show, the Kickstarter or these interview series, which I think are really interesting. I'm learning so much about the cast and the process. As you remember from my episode, this is all relatively new to me as well. So just to hear all the things I didn't know is truly fascinating. Anyway, I'll throw it to Gabe and Sungwon. Hope you enjoy. What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Night Crew Interviews, a show that I am affectionately calling the Night Crew Duty Log. My name is Gabe, and today I'm talking to Sungwon Cho, the voice of Captain Mansfield in the Night Crew. Sungwon, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely excited to have you on. Uh, Captain Mansfield is hilarious. He's an amazing character. I feel like you have brought just a wonderful voice to bring that character to life. And I'm excited to talk about Captain Mansfield and, and all that kind of stuff, along with a lot of other things. You are a very busy person. And so I'm excited <laughs> to talk about a lot of different things that you have done in the past and that you're working on right now. But before we get into that, give me like your, your two minute bio. Who are you? How'd you get into acting and voice acting, all that kind of thing? Sure. Uh, I'm Sung Won Cho. I'm a voice actor. I've been in video games and animation primarily. And I also do YouTube on ProZD, P-R-O-Z-D, where I just make all sorts of videos, skits and other sorts of videos where I just do whatever I feel like. Uh, that's sort of the the TLDR of what I do. Yeah, I saw on your YouTube channel, you do lots of stuff. Uh, you even do board game reviews, which I'm a mm-hmm. game designer. I'm a game publisher. That's how Peter C. Hayward and I met each other many moons ago. It's, just, it's awesome with all the different things that you do. Now, tell me what it's like to be YouTube famous. You have over 3 million subscribers. What is that like? What's it been like to go from zero to 3 million plus? Tell me about it. You know, it, it's surreal uh, for sure. It's not something I, I ever expected would happen. There was a time in, you know, where I thought 100,000 thousand was impossible. I thought that was an impossible goal to reach. And I thought, well, maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be lucky enough to to hit a hundred thousand, but I, I sincerely doubt it. Uh, but as time has gone on, uh, that went soared past that at some point, uh, it's gratifying to have a lot of people, you know, enjoy stuff that you make. And then at the same time, it's also not scary, but it's definitely is something to get used to when, you realize a lot more people know who you are and your face. Uh, like, you know, when you get in, recognized in, in public and uh, it makes it so that uh, your not necessarily privacy is changed, but a bit like when if I go out in public or whatever, there's there's a good chance that at least one one or two people will recognize me and maybe want like a photo or something. And if I'm at like a convention or something, that's Conventions are almost impossible to navigate at this point. So uh, that's also something that's changed. Yeah, it's definitely something that a lot of people don't think about. They want to be famous or YouTube famous, but then there's also some side effects to that. There's pros and cons, uh, like mm-hmm. everything else. Tell me about 
how how you grew the channel. How did you go from zero to 100,000 to now over 3 million? What do you think it is about your channel that keeps bringing in new subscribers? Huh. I think initially, you know, I don't know. It, it, it just kind of felt like a fluke, like in the beginning, because I, I'd been, you know, making stuff on the channel for a while. But, uh, well, I guess it wasn't necessarily a fluke because I grew an, an audience online actually on Tumblr first by doing like audio posts uh, on there daily. That was a, a goal I set out for myself after graduating from college. I wanted to be a voice actor and I knew this, so I wasn't sure how to even get to that point, but I knew I had to just start practicing. So I dedicated myself to doing one audio post every single day, and I didn't miss a single day for several years. And that started to grow an audience, and then that led to something like Vine, like Vine where I, I got some popularity on there. And then eventually, uh, when Vine went away, I went back to YouTube and just kind of started to focus a bit on that. I would credit my growth to just years of just diligence and like putting my nose to the grind just getting the work done uh and not worrying so much because my i never had any aspirations for youtube fame or anything like that it just sort of happened but then for me i think what keeps people coming back is they might find one type of video and then at this point i have a lot of other videos maybe related to that like a skit like if they come for the skits they start to just watch all the skits but then they might watch one where I try a bunch of food or try or talk about board games. And I think what keeps people coming back is I'm a pretty I'm pretty genuine about who I am on. The, like I don't put on a persona or anything. I I think there's a genuine feeling that people get watching me of like this. Yeah, this is what this guy is like. I want to see what this guy does uh, or think he's funny or whatever. And I want to keep coming back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've talked to so many content creators and the word consistency comes up all the time is just being consistent like you were doing and posting every single day, which is kind of crazy. And then doing that for years. But that's one, one thing that leads into mm -hmm. uh, this kind of success is being consistent and building an audience, building a brand and people get to know you and they get to know the authentic you like you're saying. And uh, it's amazing that it takes, you know, years to become an overnight success. <laughs> but that's just the nature <laughs> of, of the business. All right. So you mentioned you knew you wanted to be a voice actor. I know you got into voice acting while you were in high school. Tell me about like, how did you know, like what drew you to this type of job, to this area in the industry? What made you know you wanted to do it? And then how did you pursue it early on? The moment I knew I wanted to do it was uh, I would do these radio plays that my friend wrote in high school, where he would just cast all his friends to play all the characters. He would start casting me and there was a moment recording one of them where I realized that it had gone beyond just like me, like sort of doing a quote unquote silly voice, actually getting into the character. Like I was so in the moment that I felt like I had become the character in the moment and was like actually invested in and like, I don't know, just really in it. And that feeling uh, made me go, this is something that I, I actually want to do. Uh, Cause I was very familiar with voice actors. Like even like as a kid, I would study like, credits for cartoons and and i had an ear for recognizing oh like this actor plays this character in this show and this character in this show and i had this sort of encyclopedic knowledge of like voice actors and so i think it was like i knew it was a profession and then when i finally did it and like really enjoyed it on an amateur level that was when i realized oh this is something i want to do so it really just came down to like how did i start to pursue it was the the whole tumblr actually it was just putting yourself out there making things people started to notice and then that led to like my first audition for an indie game down the road and then when you once you do a good job with that people will refer you to other directors and other projects and so on because really a lot of getting into the industry is just making a name for yourself in any way uh and then it's like who you know after that it's like who can vouch for you not only for your skill but also for your easiness to work with and that sort of thing. Early on, it was just getting people to know who I was by just making things. And eventually that led to other opportunities, professional opportunities, and it sort of, you just sort of climb the mountain from there. Uh, whether that's voice acting or YouTube, they're pretty similar in that you just have to keep going, just keep climbing and just working at it. Right. There's really no substitute for reps. You know, kind of like if you want to get in shape, you can go in the weight room and stand around and that's not going to do anything. You have to lay down on the bench, press bench and, and do reps. You have to go do some reps on the squat rack. Mm -hmm. There's just no substitute. And so getting out there and, and doing it. Tell me a little bit about your process. So you talked about 
creating characters and then kind of becoming the character. What's your process look like when you're trying to bring a character to life, either one that's just kind of in your head or one that you're going to do an audition for? Tell me about it. So usually, you know, you look at the sides and if they give you a description of the character, they'll usually also offer like what they're kind of looking for in terms of voice quality. But let's say they don't even do that. They just give you a script and you've got the dialogue. Then for me, it's just sort of at this point, I think I have a pretty good gut. I know like I can pull this voice out just from like gut instinct of having done this for so long. So if a character is supposed to be, let's let's take the captain, for example, like he's a rugged, like, you know, kind of no nonsense military man, like with a, with a past. It's for me, I just sort of go, OK, if this guy were a real guy that I could just listen to right now. What do I think he would sound like? Uh, as simple as that sounds, but it, it is just sort of going, okay, well, if he's an older guy, he might sound a little more like this, you know, that sort of gravelly. I've played a lot of characters with that sort of quality of they're either a, a soldier or an older man. Just imagining his existence, that sort of baseline voice immediately springs to mind for me. I'm just like, yeah, that quality of that. Maybe a little gravel, maybe a little sort of thing. So it's hard to describe, but, you know, I, I think you also draw a lot of inspiration, maybe just from like watching other stuff and like influences and just hearing all sorts of voices. There's like kind of like a fun aspect of like, if you look at a picture of a character or a description of a character and going, uh, what would that sound like if I brought that to life? And just basing it off of your own experiences and instincts. I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, as far as like practicing, do you just walk around the house and talk to your wife and eat breakfast in these different voices or when you're riding around in the car? Like, how do you practice? Tell me about that. <laughs> no, I don't really walk around doing these voices. I almost consider like every voiceover session I have is in its in its own way, like practice, right? It's just doing the job. It's improve and practice in your own way. But I guess before, like between sessions, every now and then, sometimes I will actually read th if it's like a particular complicated script that I will maybe read through it once out loud establish what I think the where I think the voice should be but I try not to like stick to it too hard because every now and then you go in and you think you know you yeah I this is the voice I'm going to do and they go actually we've changed the character or actually let's completely do a different direction and so you have to be able to completely like discard whatever it is you've prepared in your mind. For me, I guess it's more just maybe reading through it. If I'm completely home alone, like if if, if my wife is out, then maybe sometimes, uh, sometimes I have like played around a little bit with just like doing like voices, saying things in a voice or whatever. I, I've definitely done that before, but oftentimes it's just a simple just kind of read through in character. And yeah, that's that's pretty much the most practice I do. Gotcha. I feel like if I was a voice actor, I would just go into different voices in normal life. Uh, if I'm at a restaurant <laughs> ordering food or Starbucks, I feel like I would just try some things out. And maybe that's completely different than the way I look. And uh, now I'm talking like a British girl or something like that. I feel like I would have some fun. Do you ever do anything like that? I think that comes out during board games. So whenever I'm playing board games, you just subconsciously like I'll just like, especially if it's like me taunting somebody or me like you know, we're all just kind of, you know, riffing or ribbing at each other um voices will definitely come out like for some reason especially card games like card games where it's about you know kind of like that sort of take that sort of nature uh i, I for some reason, i start doing a russian accent sometimes you know i don't know why <laughs> but i uh, it, it just sort of feels appropriate or i don't know just like or if, if the game itself brings some sort of theme like maybe maybe there's like a we're all different characters like then i i may like every now and then do a like a, a voice in character, quote unquote. See, I think that's where it mostly comes out is uh, if I'm just kind of goofing around, like playing board games with, with friends. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. All right. So you've done voice work for video games and shows and different mediums now. Uh, tell me what it's like. Like what, what's different about doing a voice over or voice acting for a video game versus a TV show or something else? A video game is um, almost always way more extensive in terms of the dialogue. Uh, if you're a main character, which I've done, that can include just like you are recording all the dialogue options for the entire game. And not only that, but battle efforts can be pretty uh, taxing where you're 
doing all your get shot once okay now you get shot twice all right now you're getting your arm cut off now you're getting punched in the head now you are punching someone in the head and just doing like three takes of each three takes of each going down the line it's usually a lot more work and in a lot of cases a lot more taxing work but at the same time it can be very satisfying because depending on your role you may have like a lot more insight into the character uh because you just have so much more dialogue for animation generally it's well, it depends on the character you are, but let, let's say you're going in just for like an episode. Generally, much less volume of how many lines you need to record. Generally less taxing, but like it can be kind of fun with animation. Sometimes, sometimes you'll get the storyboards and get to see those. Whereas some, with a lot of video games, you're usually just going off an Excel sheet. Like uh, the director and an Excel sheet, you don't have visuals on what anything looks like or what even you might look like. Whereas with animation, there is usually more of like reference for like what things are supposed to look like and what you look like. That and also if if you're in in some cases, you get to actually record with other actors, which is not common in video game recording. Usually in video game recording, you're alone in the booth. But with some animation stuff, like if, if there is like, you know, especially if you're in scenes with the main cast or in the main cast then like it's you and a couple actors all together getting to kind of like read off each other that's really really fun so i think both experiences are tremendously rewarding but they each have like their own sort of like perks i would say very cool all right so you've also done some live action uh, acting work Tell me about Anime Crimes Division. Uh, it's a hilarious show. I've seen several episodes on YouTube. It's a lot of fun, it, especially if you get the references. If you are familiar with anime, if you're familiar with a lot of like the jargon and vocabulary you guys throw out in jokes, the show is really good. It's really funny. So tell me about how that project came to be and how you got on board with it. And then in a second, we can talk more about like live action acting versus voice acting. I got involved with that because uh, Freddie Wong, who is uh, one of the directors and creators of the of the show, I, I knew him and he approached me at a con we were both guessing at just asking me very casually if I'd be interested in be like acting in a thing, like a live action thing. And I just immediately said yes, because uh, Freddie does amazing work. I was like, I'm flattered you asked. And yes, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if you want me like I've never done this before, but uh, yes, I would. I would. And so he's like, cool. And then I think a couple months later, he messaged me and then said, all right, we're doing it. Here's the scripts. Here are the lead. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and not only that, it's like the lead for like a gritty crime drama parody with anime tropes, which was great. The scripts were great, but I was very intimidated uh, because I'd never done anything like that before, like on camera, like on that scale. Like the difference between, you know, that like live action acting and voice acting, like primarily is unless you're doing motion capture, you don't have to memorize your lines for voice acting. You always have a script in front of you. So there's always that you don't have to worry about that, that pressure of like memorizing stuff. But with live action, obviously, you got to memorize that whole day's worth of, of lines. And it's usually out of order. Like you're not filming in chronological order. Um, there's also just having to be aware of what you do with your body. Like in the booth, you have, you don't have to worry about it at all. You don't what you look like and your facial expressions, your what you're even what your hands are doing. But with live action work, everything is on camera. So it's at first pretty intimidating, but it's just, it's kind of fun. It, it's fun to just, you know, actually like, quote unquote, like live it out. Like, oh, like you're actually getting to pick up stuff and like interact with other people. Um, that's another thing that's different in the, is that a lot of voiceover is solitary. And in live action, you're, you're getting to like see people directly like in the eyes, like, you know, interacting directly with people is something you don't get to do a ton of in voiceover. Those qualities just alone made it very, very different. It felt like being pushed into the deep end of a pool, but I was fortunate to be surrounded by an extremely supportive crew and cast. And I think I managed pretty good. Like, I think for me, whenever I'm pushed into something I'm not used to, I am usually up for the challenge of just trying to make it work. Yeah. And I think you did an excellent job. Now, is it also kind of a benefit where you are around the cast and there's the camera folks and there's the people doing makeup and costume and like you kind of have a, a much bigger sphere of people all of a sudden. Is that maybe a little bit overwhelming or is it also kind of fun because you're getting to know a lot more people, a lot more different kinds of people? It's really fun. It really feels like because we've done two seasons and it, every time we did it, it felt like 
going back to summer camp and seeing all these like familiar faces, you're basically together like for 12 hour days for like two weeks straight. And so it's this intense bonding experience of like, you're seeing cast every day, you're seeing makeup, you're seeing like all these people are basically all all together for like two weeks. And it's so, you know, when you're doing good work, everyone feels it and everyone is just having, obviously I'm sure there are some nightmare sets, but for me, Anime Crimes was a, just an absolute joy all, all throughout. Like everyone was super friendly and super like super good at what they did. So it was just like a joy to see all these people. And when you, when you like finish up, it feels like kind of sad. It's like, Oh man, like, I don't get to see you guys like we've been seeing each other every day for two weeks and like talking and you know hanging out and then working together and then just like that it's like everyone scatters it's like all right we're all done and then you everyone everyone leaves it's a huge emotional high of like being around all these people and then suddenly all right that's done unless we get another season like back to normal and it's surreal but I frankly loved the experience like it if I could do more live action work in, in with that level of like good people and a good project, I would definitely do it again because it, it, to me, that was a very positive experience. Yeah. And I hope you get that opportunity. Tell me a little bit about like some of your favorite roles, some of your favorite characters and what really make, makes those stand out as some of your favorites, or maybe some of your favorite lines or anything like that. Uh, my favorite characters tend to be ones where I got to spend the most time with them. The two that like come to mind are... Uh, I voiced Flack in uh, Borderlands 3, and they're the main one of the main playable characters. So they had a lot of lines, which meant I got to really get a handle on their personality. And, and also they have really funny lines, too, because they're this sort of... They're like a killer hunter robot, but they love the animals. <laughs> and they also uh, have, like, a very dry sense of humor. Like, I like the sort of contrast of, like murderous bloodthirst but also having a dry dry sense of humor as well was is a very funny combination for me uh, another character that comes to mind is uh there's a character i played named hyodo from uh, a, an anime called agretsuko on netflix where he's this very no nonsense like businessman on the outside but he's this very passionate idol manager <laughs> at night also a really fun sort of like contrast in terms of very straight laced very serious but then gets really like in, like intensely passionate about like his idol managing like that character i got to play them for the whole season like they were in every episode except one so again i had a lot of time to like really get to experience you know being them and uh, seeing their story through. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the night crew. Tell me about how you first found out about the show, how you got to be in, uh, involved with the project. I received uh, an email from my agent that uh, Peter had reached out and was interested in me for, for the roles, not just for the captain, but for Aston as well. Pretty much my agent brought it to me was how I uh, heard about it. What gets you excited about this series, about being able to play Captain Mansfield for, you know, several episodes? Tell me what gets you going. For me, I, I just, I think the writing is great. I think it's very, very clever and funny. And there is the fun sort of like challenge of, I, I voice two characters in it. So like sometimes they have to talk back and forth. That can be a fun technical challenge. And then also just getting to work with uh, the the other castmates. Like there are some people uh, on this cast that I'm, you know, very familiar with their work. They're, you know, they're you know long working voice actors and who I've greatly admired. So being able to be a part of that cast is a, is an honor. But yeah, and and also just for the test read, there was just a really fun dynamic of just getting to hear everyone's performances and hear everyone's laughter, and that that was also really fun as well. So. All of that is stuff that I'm excited for if we get to do more. Very cool. And like you said, the, the writing is really good. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I'm also really excited to just kind of see where the series goes. Well, this has been awesome. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on YouTube, ProZD, P-R-O-Z-D, uh, Twitter. Um, basically, just Google ProZD and you'll find me uh, on all pretty much whatever social media platforms I'm on. 
Awesome. Well, Sung Wan, really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you joining me here on the Night Crew Duty Log. Good luck with all the many projects that you have in the works and everything else you got going on right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That was Gabe Barrett. You can check out his podcast, The Board Game Design Lab, either in the show notes or just by Googling it. Really interesting stuff on there. He's been going for hundreds of episodes at this point, including several with me. One last reminder, our Kickstarter is still running, so please don't forget to check it out, nightcrewpodcast.com. Just click the big link and you'll be taken straight there. Our next episode is going to be with Simon Anthony, who voices the ship's alarms, the sirens. He has actually got his own YouTube channel as well. It's got 350,000 subscribers. It is a fascinating look into the world of Sudoku. So we'll be back with that very shortly. Thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.